Hey, bro. Oh, I got bad news. I just... I don't know, bro. I just feel like everything that we're doing is for nothing. Like, I'm really starting to think that it's just not gonna happen. I'm just tired of grinding and putting in so much effort for nothing. I literally don't think anything else can go wrong. I've been in front of three booners this year and haven't been able to capitalize on a single one of them. I don't know, bro. It's been like the season from hell, dude. Is that him? Dude, it has to be. If that's not him, that's another freaking shooter. His body's already so big and it's summer. It's like June 30th and he's like well-defined fat 10 point. That's insane, dude. So we spent a lot of the time glassing bean fields in the summer, door knocking, all sorts of stuff that was new to us, but we knew that we had to put in extra work that we've never done before in order to get on these deer consistently. I would say the biggest steps that we took in order to better be prepared was mineral sites from the spring all the way until season, getting a lot more trail cameras, cellular trail cameras, so that way we didn't have to go and pull cards, glassing bean fields, door knocking, getting new pieces of permission. We did more this year than we've ever done before. Let's get her done. It's a long walk. It's a long walk. The dude, the dude is like, I have one rule. And we're like, what's that? He goes, don't drive over the beans. <laughs> like half a mile out, carrying a hundred pounds in a camera. What we do to kill big deer. Everyone's like, you can get on a big one. It's not hard, it's hard. A lot, a lot, a lot of, of work. A lot of this grinding stuff that you don't see. And it's what, like 100 degrees? Like maybe 95? 92. Let's go. So the 2022-2023 season didn't go as expected. I think going into the season and all throughout the summer, we had high expectations. We had a lot of 150-ish deer last year that we had passed. You know, this year was gonna be a big year. We were gonna have a ton of options. And in some cases, we did have a lot of options. We narrowed in our game plan. We did a lot more door knocking. We, the deer that we had on our radar weren't even necessarily where we had hunted in years past. We realized that we needed to do a lot more, you know, glassing bean fields, which we did. Three or four nights a week, we would just go out sometimes even more sometimes literally every single day that week we would go out and um, keep an eye on the deer watch them grow while you know gaining new permission pieces for me my season was my season started in july so we're on top of the world we are on cloud nine at the moment because we put a camera up at a random place that we scouted okay we thought it looked good we got permission at this piece and we're like no rumors or anything like that. We just, no scouting. We went in, we scouted saw, once. We saw a ton of beds and we we're like, okay, there's some decent sign. We put up a trail camera. A month and a half goes by. The biggest buck that walks by is like Probably 120 inches at like at the most. This property's just not going to work out. We have some other properties that we want to go ahead and activate. Well, guess what? Uh, a I, giant, bro. A freaking he's, giant. He's a thinking. six or seven point with his brows alone. Probably 20 inches in just his brows. Probably, yeah. I can't believe we were about to take this down today. Literally, it would have... The camera would have, have already been down, but we got soaked at our first property today. So we came home to change, and we're like, dude, it's just going to keep raining, and we don't want to go up there and get absolutely soaked again. So we elected to just cancel that, and that would have literally already been down. We would not have known. We would have literally never known this deer even existed. So all summer, I had been tracking and feeding this one deer called King Neptune. Um, he, had tr he had triple split brows, a pretty framey 
end side spread. Um, I think a mainframe 10, just with crazy brows and some stickers. Um, probably pretty close to 170 inches, maybe a little bit more. Um, really hard to tell. Um, in velvet, he just looked like an absolute monster. And it just kind of happened accidentally. We were actually looking for a 240 inch deer. Um, this was before we really had a lot of information on it. We just knew that he was in a specific area and we were given a couple trail camera photos. So we tried to match the trail camera photos to kind of like the environments. And um, I had a cool opportunity. I had, um, I had permission piece to throw up a camera at this one area and we ended up getting this giant deer. Um, so yeah, I named him King Neptune because of his triple splits. They kind of look like uh, King Neptune's trident. And uh, so that's what we called him. And I had this deer in the palm of my hand. I knew exactly what he was doing from day one. July, August, all of September. He was daylighting almost every day, if not showing up multiple times at night. So this deer was definitely in the area close and I knew where he bedded. I looked on Spartan Forge. We pretty much had this deer figured out. <clears throat> so opening day comes around and Justin and I are in the tree. You know, we feel pretty confident. I'm feeling a little bit nervous actually because I've never been so confident hunting a deer. Before I was just kind of going into an area where I thought there'd be a big deer. If you watched the video of, tur of Turkey Foot, deer back there, um, it just kind of happened. And I got, I, got, I got really blessed and lucky with that one. But for this deer was the first deer that I was like, this is a big one. And I, I've got him patterned. He showed up at 7.30 every day. Sure enough, 7.30 rolls around. It's a little bit darker than I had thought in that area, in that patch of woods. Um, but I made the call, stepped right out into the shooting lane. It looked good. We were celebrating. We had thought that this is, this is it. I think I got a good shot of him. I see the air right now. He kind of walked off real slow. We didn't hear him crash. I'm assuming he probably bedded because he didn't run for very long. Uh, we watched the shot back. Don't underestimate the great case, baby. This is where, this is where he stopped for a second. Let's see. And you can see, you, well, it's, real, it's up here. I know, I'm just getting a shot. Oh yeah, look at that. You can tell this is where he slowed down and was like that breathing blood real is, heavy. doesn't look like long though. It's still steaming. I'm not seeing like any blood. Um, I'm honestly, I'm astonished that he's went this far. Um, like when I tell you guys, I've, ne I've helped a lot of people track deer. I've never seen deer like that with a fixed blade broadhead. And it was just pouring out of him. What well, long, long blood too. There's that light blood with some bubbles in it. There's not a ton of that. And we haven't found the other end of the arrow. So we've been still, on this trail the entire time. There's still probably 15 or 16 inches of arrow still in him with a broadhead in there. So like, I mean, I honestly, it's against all odds. I would have put money on him that we would have found him like 50 yards away from where we shot him. But after two hours, he's still he's still here. So we're we're just gonna give it time. It sucks, but what are you gonna do? One more puddle. But that blood was stupid. Because if I mean, from the seams that if he went that far, I can't imagine that but you had both lungs. I can't imagine they can, I mean, they can do whatever they have they want apparently, but hitting both lungs allows them to not be able to breathe. And quartering too is the only thing I can think of. When he wasn't quartering too that much, like, I don't know from the He was pretty much right. broadside. Like, if I had to say he was quartering two or broadside, he was broadside. But 
it's not even like how far he went that gets me. It's just the amount of time. Well, come to find out, you know, after tracking him for a little bit, um, no sign of him. You know, there was a time where we had tracked his blood, maybe three hours after the shot, we looked at the arrow and uh, about um, 16 inches of penetration, blood looked good, the arrow had broken off um, right next to where I had shot him. And um, so it wasn't a clean pass through, but it was 16 inches of penetration. It looked good, we got other opinions and they're like, looks like a dead deer to me. I was out there for three or four days after that, all day, every day not drinking or eating, just trying to figure out where this deer was and figured I was doing a little bit more damage than good as you know he wasn't showing up on camera and I thought that maybe he, he was just dead on a property that I didn't have permission to search. So that really got me down. I went around knocking on doors trying to get permission to, you know, to find this deer, but in all reality I I searched basically every possible area that this deer could have been without being on the main road. I don't know. Even watching it back in my head, I don't see how I didn't kill this deer, but I don't know. We're just, I think that's just the worst part is we don't, we don't know. So unfortunately, I can't afford to just not look for him and hope that he shows back up. But we also don't want to spook him out of the area. If we're out here trying to find a deer that's not dead, we're just going to push him off to the point where he's not going to ever come back. So it's like, it's a lose, lose, lose all-time low. When we but. found out that it wasn't a lethal hit, it was a little worrisome. I was still very confident that it was going to happen. I mean, this deer had very little pressure in the area that we were hunting, and I was confident Zach would be able to get it done, but it did add, obviously, a little bit more worry and a little bit more stress because instead of going down to one person hunting, we still had both of us. I believe it was in 2020. Um, he was six and a half at the time, and he was probably right around mid 60s as a mainframe eight. He was just an absolute giant, crazy mass, everything you could want in a typical. Um, awesome deer. I wasn't really on the radar because it wasn't in a spot that we had a ton of permission at. So that deer was kind of just on the back burner. But after I killed Prodigy, Zach and I were talking, and we we're like, all right, so what's the game plan for this next year? What what deer do we have as options? And that was definitely one that came up quite a bit. So with Kahuna, we got a bunch of good permission pieces where he was. Um, we ended up setting up cameras and everything like that. He didn't show up until more towards the end of October. Um, and we never got a picture of him, um, but a buddy of ours did. And he had dropped probably about 30 to 40 inches from the previous year. He was eight and a half this year, and we kind of think that he just got sick in the summer, or maybe this was, was just his drop-off year. And I mean, you can't sustain a 170-inch mainframe eight uh, eight-point rack as an eight and a half year old. At least not very many deer can. We didn't end up pursuing him. Um, he ended up getting shot, I believe, by a neighbor. So still cool to see such a legend go down. He was he was still a really cool deer. Yeah, that one was kind of like. Dang, that kind of sucks. I'd say the second one was a deer we called the Freak. Um, not very much history. Uh, we got a couple, a couple pictures from a buddy, um, just kind of telling us where it was. He drove by and actually saw him. So we hopped in there and put a, got a, we got one really good piece that where the picture was taken, it made sense that he would be living in there. Looking at this patch, I mean, you can literally see, and that has to be it. He has to be here. At like, the end of the day, I mean, we just need to get a picture of him here. I mean, this is just one piece to possibly hunt him. Yeah. I think we just got to make sure he's in this area before. So he said no hunting, but we can at least put a camera up. And that's going to give us a lot of information because as of right now, we're completely shooting in the dark. But this camera, we're going to put some whitetail mash out, some corn, and see if he's even around. And if he is around, there are some other properties that we may be able to secure around here and hunt like the other side of the patch of woods. But Definitely a step in the right direction, just not the step that we were hoping it would be. But I mean, we gotta do what we gotta do. Yeah. Looking at CBC. Okay. This, all the trails kind of intersect here. We got water, we got bedding. 
in theory this is a sweet spot without the ag which is what we're finding is actually there's a lot of big deer around sweet spots that have zero ag but there's a lot of acorns lots of browse uh but now we've got something they've never seen before the mash the corn let's go i um, mean we fed there and all throughout the summer and then early in the season uh, we never got any pictures of him we got other bucks and stuff like that but we never got any pictures of him so it was a long shot for sure to say he was on the shooter list is kind of tough whenever you don't have any pictures of him yourself um, but that was definitely another deer that was on the hit list and we were hoping to get on because I mean who knows he could have been 190s possibly even 200s this year guess who just showed up not only is he alive but he's back in the core area where I shot him he was completely gone MIA did not show up on any of our cameras for two and a half weeks, but uh, he showed up. His wound looks pretty bad, but not fatal. But there's a cold front coming in tomorrow, about 15 to 20 degree temp drop. Justin and I are gonna sit in the spot that we shot him at, and hopefully he comes in. It's just such a relief to know that he's alive. I kept telling myself that he was, and that he's probably just on a neighboring property, but like there was a little voice in the back of my head that was telling me this deer has been dead. This deer, you just didn't find him. You know, we spooked him too soon and he just ran away and we, you know, he ran to a property that we don't have access to. And we, you know, those thoughts were running through my head. Um, but those thoughts have been put to rest, you know, been doing a lot of praying, a lot of searching, been super low and down for the last two and a half weeks. But today really um, revived the story. The story goes on. So it wasn't King Neptune, but it was a big eight point that showed up quite a few times. Actually, I passed him about four or five times this season, um, but that was pretty easy to do, knowing that I was going to have my shot at a much bigger deer. I wanted to finish the story. But I pretty much stayed out. I pretty much stayed out unless the weather was perfect. And uh, every time it was perfect, I was blessed with an awesome homeowner who allowed me to you know, hunt almost whenever I wanted to, he never said no. So I got out there, November 2nd rolls around, we get, we get in the tree. I honestly wasn't expecting to see him. It was more just, I gotta sit today. And uh, he ended up showing up. I got it, I got it. Just get ready. Took him 17 minutes. 
to make his way from maybe 80 yards away all the way to 30. And you know, as he's there in my shooting lane, he's not broadside at all. And I made the rookie mistake. I grabbed the bow too early. Um, and the tree, the only tree that was really suitable for this setup, I had to basically hunt from a saddle and shoot on my opposite side. Um, so I have the bow over my bridge and I'm just holding it there and I'm starting to shake. For about four minutes, he just kind of stays there. He doesn't, you know, he stays head on, not broadside. Out of blink of an eye, he just decides to take off. I had a hole about this big to shoot. I'm on him. The arrow went through the gap that I had, but missed him entirely. And as to how that happened, I have no idea. I completely missed him, and at this point I am just devastated. I, a, a true low spot of the season, I think, was probably then. Um, I had already just told myself that I can't, like this is my shot, I have to make this happen, it's this or nothing, this is my season, this is everything I've done this summer leads up to this point, and I missed. And I feel like I let myself down, I feel like I let Justin down, I feel like I let, you know, all of the subscribers down, the people who love us and fo follow us, I feel like I let you down. And it was just really embarrassing for me, and honestly, like my confidence was taken at that point. Um, and I just relive that forever, um, that miss. We're out here scouting boys. As you guys can see, pretty good buck. A buck we got a little bit of history with. Not necessarily named him because we haven't targeted him before, but he looks pretty good for July 10th, so enjoy. Bubba, you know, kind of, I liked him because he, he had a really cool name that Zach and I came up with. Um, it was a deer we got a, some really cool footage of in the summer. Um, he was probably, before he broke his time, probably pretty close to 160 as a mainframe 10. Um, kind of a cool little split brow. Wasn't anything that jumped off at me. He was five and a half, so it was a mature deer that we would have targeted. But um, we had so many other leads on deer 15, 20, and some even in the case of 40 to 50 inches bigger than him that were definitely ahead on the radar and he was so patternable. I mean on the cameras he was in there every single evening in daylight an hour or two before like we were definitely in there in his home range and we figured all right we'll try everything else worst case scenario we can come back here and that's kind of how we got the name of backup. The difference is he broke off his G2 so I mean that was one of his one of his better times so with him breaking that off he probably lost five to seven inches so he was probably down into the mid 50s so it was a deer that I was still going to target because he was five and a half and I didn't have any other options um, but I wanted to make a couple last ditch efforts at some of these other deer.
<laughs> We're rolling. We're rolling. Well, this is day number one of prep for Mr. Clean, the possible new number one world record typical. Um, and my biggest lead that I spent most of my season on, um, the deer that still haunts me every single night, um, is a deer that we called Mr. Clean. Uh, he got the name, um, obviously, because he is just a giant clean deer, um, a deer that we possibly thought could make a running at the top three. So it was a deer that I had I'd gone all in on. Um, I'd put eight cameras up over the course of two miles in a circle um, of where he was spotted. Um, so that was kind of where I spent most of my season. And this is gonna be its own separate video, so I'm not gonna go do a deep dive in on it. But that was kind of what I spent most of the season on, chasing, bouncing around, asking new pieces, glassing bean fields. And I mean, this was the deer that I spent hours every single day game planning, getting on Spartan Forge, talking with Zach, trying to get a game plan, and honestly just trying to lay my eyes on him because the size that he was the year before was unreal, let alone what he could have been this year at five and a half or six and a half. So in the search for Mr. Clean, um, obviously a lot of permission pieces, a lot of cameras were up. Um, we ended up having another deer that was probably in the 70s, um, a deer that had just crazy mass, and I came up with the name of Moose. Um, it was a deer that I'm stupid for it now, but I probably should have spent a lot more time on it. But when you're chasing what could have possibly been one of the top typicals ever taken, um, he was definitely in the back of my head, but he was nowhere near the top of my priority list. Um, as November went on and Mr. Clean hadn't shown and it had been a month, month and a half, um, Moose started to uh, make his way more towards my mind. Um, so we ended up going back in there and putting up some corn, hopefully, hoping that after rut he would kind of show back up um, and be hungry and whatnot and stick around in the area. That didn't happen, so I kind of got a two for one kick in the nuts on that one. Lost uh, Moose and then didn't end up getting a chance at Mr. Clean. I spent all of November and the majority of December in wait for King Neptune's return. I have a feeling him and every other buck in the area took off to an unknown rut location that I was unable to find and stayed there until the end of season. I hope he made it through the winter because I don't even know if this deer is still alive. But as the season was coming to an end, I couldn't put all my eggs in one basket. I had to pivot. So I began hunting a deer we named Poseidon. And we had a deer show up in October on one of our permission pieces that was a bit of a stud, actually. He was a really nice deer. He looks mature. Um, we didn't have any history at this property, so we don't really know what he was like last year or what, or what he did. Um, but we called him Poseidon because his frame was pretty similar to King Neptune. And, uh, you know, it just seemed like a fitting name. So um, we ended up getting this deer about every night pretty late but this permission piece was well over 200 acres, so we felt like maybe he bedded on the property. Um, we're at a property that we actually got permission this summer. We know nothing about this property. We haven't even sat here at all. So we first got the picture of this, of this deer in October, and he was on the hit list, but he just really wasn't consistent enough, and we had more consistent bucks. Um, well, everything's been shifted around, everything's changed, and this deer is becoming a little bit more consistent every day. But uh, we're just gonna go feed at this property. Um, we might throw up another camera to see if we can figure out exactly where he's coming from and where he's going. Whatever buck did this was obviously a bigger buck because for one, it's a bit higher up on the tree, but for two, it's tore up from all angles. So if you think about it, the antlers literally wrapping around all this and it's just getting caught everywhere. This is a good tree for a smaller deer to die on. This is the kind of tree that you 
you walk up to a to a dead head. But uh, it's fresh. You can tell it's fresh because all all this stuff is laying on top of the leaves. So this must have been done within the last month for sure because obviously the leaves it's were like falling the last couple of weeks bef bef before that. Come taste this and see if it's him. Okay. It actually, it's kind of fresh. Um, after hanging at multiple cameras and really pinpointing this area, we realized that he bedded just off the property, but he came onto the property to feed because there was um, some ag on this property. So we figured um, with the right weather and with the right wind, and if we played our cards right, we could get a shot at him in the evening. Um, but that definitely came with some surprises. I stay optimistic um, because being pessimistic never helps. I mean, if you just always think that everything sucks and life sucks, you're always going to find out that life does suck. Zach, I'm Zach's the pessimist, and not necessarily in life, but when it came to this season, Zach, Zach's all for what it was. But I tried to give as much hope as I could. Enough, he showed up right at the end of shooting light. I would say three or four deer were around me downwind and they were just blowing up a storm. They were stomping, staring, cussing, this, that, and the other. They were letting me know I was there. And he didn't seem to care that much. The big mature buck like that should have ran away, but he didn't. In my head, as you can probably imagine, I'm just replaying King Neptune in my mess, and I'm telling myself, surely I can make it happen now. Surely nothing will go wrong. Surely this is how it plays out. At the end, after all the work that you put in, surely I won't come up empty-handed.
Thicker than I'll get out in here. It's thicker than I'll get out. Look at the corn real quick. I don't know if there's any blood, like impact blood. seem like it but where was he he was like to say without looking at the footage. He ducked. Turned, missed him completely. I'd like to say that's probably the end of the season for me. I mean, I guess there's always a chance, but yeah, I don't know. That one hurt. Take a little bit of time to get over, but it hasn't really quite set in yet, so I'm sure it'll get worse. At this point, the wound from King Neptune in the previous two misses had been so it hadn't healed yet, so it almost didn't hurt as much. He ducked quite a bit. He ducked quite a bit, and I really don't think it would have been a great shot, anyways. And honestly, like, it was just a bad shot. I could have made it happen. I should have made it happen. Um, watching the replay, it's not like he ducked and turned enough to where it saved his life. He ducked and he turned a little bit and I clean missed him. Um, 
And that's something I'm willing to accept. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that, you know, it was a perfect shot. He just ducked a crazy amount, he didn't. What I do know is I missed a third opportunity at a, a 70 plus inch deer three times this year. Um, to just have it slip through your fingers like that is humbling to say the least. In hopes that he would return with a few more weeks left of season, I decided to hunt him really hard. Well, we ended up getting trail camera photos of Poseidon without his antlers two weeks before the end of season. So the hunt for Poseidon was over. Um, so we pulled, pulled a lot of those extra cameras that weren't getting any pictures and I just set out to door knocking and getting permission and throughout that search I never found a deer that really tickled my fancy and that I was ready to hone in on and so that took up the rest of my December and at that point um, I had made the decision I was like I just got to go for Bubba. So we showed up there to change the batteries and kind of get a game plan of how to set up and the camera had been completely stolen which kind of was another kick in the nuts. Um, so we hadn't known what was going on there for the last two or three weeks, if he was still in the area or not. Um, so we moved a little bit, uh, we, hang, we hung a set, cut out all the shooting lanes, everything like that, put a camera up and everything like that, and he never showed. So that was kind of how my season ended, um, was going for a deer that had been patternable, showing up every single day, and he just ended up disappearing. I'm a hunter just like you, Justin's a hunter just like you. We came up empty handed this year, it by no means had to happen that way. Um, part of the reason it ended up empty handed was because of me. And I think I'm okay with accepting that. I know that I really dropped the ball and throughout the season, closed door after closed door. And some of those doors were out of my control and some of those doors were in my control. But I'm willing to say that the season turned out how it turned out and I learned a lot. I don't think I'll let this happen again. This year hunting has been, it's really, it's really changed how I viewed hunting. I put my life on the line to make Creek Kings work, to be a full-time job and to make money and to make it happen. And I failed. We also had mother nature going against us. I mean, it was, it's been one of the warmest years that I can remember. I mean, it was weird early season. It was opening day was in the fifties and sixties when it's typically seventies or eighties. And I mean, rut in November was upper 50s into the 60s. Um, even now, I mean, it's February 8th when we're making this, and we've had probably three or four days that have been below 20 degrees. We fought the deer, we fought the weather, we fought the homeowners. I mean, overall, I mean, it was, it was a long, long, hard season, but it's nothing we love more than to chase these whitetails. I think, I think we're fine. As long as we come out of this year, with our heads high and just to be proud of the work that that we put in because there's a lot of people out there that came up empty-handed this year it's if you want to shoot the great ones you got to pass the good ones and we did that and I'm proud of that nice. All right. That was not nearly as cinematic as it should have been. <laughs> <laughs>